Welcome. This video is going to take a look at 15.2 at the idea of aspirin. What's it used for and how is it developed? So pain is a part of our body's line of defense. And the idea is that you feel pain and you stop doing what causes the pain. But pain is unpleasant and it can dominate the senses, especially if you have chronic pain. So pain relief is de definitely needed and appropriate at times. Painkillers are a class of drug or a group of drugs called analgesics, and mild analgesics like Tylenol, aspirin, and ibuprofen are called non-narcotic because they do not affect the brain's functioning. They're available as both prescription and over-the-counter, and pain is always indicative of an underlying cause, so treatment of the cause is also crucial to your long-term health. So how does aspirin work? Well, the brain receives a signal from pain receptors in the body. These pain receptors are activated or stimulated by chemicals called prostaglandins, which are released by a cell damaged by some kind of energy. It could be thermal or heat or mechanical, like being hit with a hammer, or even chemical energy. So prostaglandins start the inflammatory response at the site, which dilates or widens the blood vessels and causes swelling and more pain. Prostaglandins can also cause an increase in the body temperature or a fever. So to be effective, a painkiller can intercept or block the signal at the source or at the brain. Mild analgesics like aspirin and what are called non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs like ibuprofen work at the site of the injury. The strong analgesics, which we'll talk about later, work in the brain. But mild analgesics prevent the stimulation of the nerve endings and limit the release of the prostaglandins, so your brain never gets the signal that you hit your thumb. So how was aspirin developed? Well, as early as 400 BC, it was known that chewing willow bark could relieve pain and fever. In early 1800, it was found out why this worked. It's salicin in the bark being converted to salicylic acid in the body. That was the active ingredient. But salicylic acid taken directly tastes awful and causes vomiting. So in 1890, the Bayer Company made an ester derivative of salicylic acid and named it aspirin. And it's really called acetyl salicylic acid because what Bayer did is replace the hydrogen in the hydroxyl group. So this hydrogen right here got replaced with this group right here, an acetyl group. <clears throat> which is a methyl group attached to a carbonyl group. So the salicylic acid and the acetyl groups are joined through this oxygen, making it an ester. So the synthesis of aspirin, salicylic acid, or 2-hydroxybenzoic acid, is converted to aspirin through esterification. Ethanoic anhydride, CH3CO parentheses 2, O, is added along with gentle heating and then either concentrated phosphoric or sulfuric acid, allowing the OCOCH2 group to replace the hydrogen on the hydroxyl group. And this isn't something you have to memorize, but um, showing the structures of salicylic acid and aspirin, you should be able to detect this difference and realize what's happened. The aspirin has to be separated. Separated or isolated, though, before it can be ingested, because you could certainly have leftover salicylic and ethanoic anhydride in there, as well as you're going to produce ethanoic acid in addition to the aspirin. So purification of aspirin uses a technique called recrystallization. So what happens after the esterification reaction takes place is the product is allowed to cool, which allows crystals to form. The crystals are then washed with chilled water, which removes the soluble acids, but leaves the less soluble aspirin crystals behind, which is the first attempt at isolation. These crystals are then dissolved in a small amount of hot ethanol, which forms a saturated solution of aspirin and impurities, but the aspirin is not highly soluble in ethanol. That's one reason for heating it is to increase the solubility, but then as soon as you let the solution start cooling, the solubility for both the aspirin and the impurities is going to decrease, but especially for the aspirin. So at that point, the aspirin will recrystallize and leave the impurities in the solution as the aspirin precipitates or recrystallizes out of that solution. So how do you know when you have pure aspirin or how pure your aspirin is? 
Well, the purity of the product can be found a couple ways. The most common probably is by melting point determination, which involves slowly melting a small sample. So you just put a few crystals in a tube and you heat it. Um, you can heat it just with a light source because it's such a small sample. And you compare that melting point to the known melting point of aspirin. And the closer it is to the, the actual melting point, the more pure your sample. Stoichiometry can also be used to determine percent yield. Otherwise, infrared or IR spectroscopy can be used to determine how much aspirin versus unreacted salicylic acid is in the sample. I've got the infrared um, spectroscopy here for both, and you show that you see that both have these orange absorptions, which is the OH and the CO in both compounds. But you notice here with salicylic acid, there's also an absorption group here for the OH that's on salicylic acid. Whereas with um, aspirin, there's this spike instead showing that the ester group is there. So even though the IRs have some similarities, there's two clear differences that lets you compare how much aspirin versus unreacted salicylic acid is in your sample. So what are the physiological effects of aspirin? It's an effective pain reliever. It reduces inflammation, and it reduces fevers, which is known as antipyretic. It was one of the first drugs to be made or synthesized and sold, and it continues to be the most widely used drug in the world. And its three effects are all due to it blocking the production of prostaglandins. But this also causes some side effects, which can be good or bad depending upon the person and their health. One side effect is that it's an anticoagulant, so it slows the clotting of blood, and this can be good for people at risk of heart attack or stroke, so they often take aspirin as a preventive measure or prophylactic. It's not so good for people during or after surgery or anyone with slow clotting blood. Another uh, side effect is bleeding and or possible ulceration of the stomach and the duodenum. Allergic reactions by some, especially asthmatics, has led to breathing issues, and it can cause Ray's syndrome in younger people, which causes liver and brain damage. The physiological effects of aspirin, both intended and side effects, are magnified or increased when taken with alcohol, particularly the stomach bleeding, and that's something known as synergy. Aspirin's highly nonpolar, making it less likely to be absorbed in the blood and the plasma. Salicylic acid with its OH group is more polar and more soluble, but aspirin's going to be slightly less soluble and more nonpolar. And ideally, you want the absorption to happen in the small intestine instead of the stomach to decrease the bleeding and the chance of ulcers. So two different issues here, solubility and where it gets absorbed at. So to delay the absorption, coatings or buffering agents are put on aspirin tablets that we know as buffered aspirin. The solubility, though, can only be increased through chemical modification of the actual aspirin molecule. The molecule needs some polarity to increase its solubility. So what's done is that ionic salts are reacted with aspirin, like NaOH or NaHCO3, so sodium hydroxide or sodium hydrogen carbonate, and the base replaces the OH on the aspirin group, increasing the solubility. This type of aspirin is called soluble aspirin or dispersible aspirin, and it's dissolved in water before drinking, like Alka-Seltzer. You drop it in water, let it react, you see the CO2 because of the NaHCO3 in there, and then it increases the solubility and hopefully the bioavailability of your aspirin.